In the interest of community service, Power 88 presents live talk shows to inform, enlighten, and to stimulate thought and dialogue. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of KCP or the EOB. Now sit back, relax, enjoy the program, and be sure to listen to Power 88 anytime from anywhere by downloading the KCP app. Good morning. Good morning to our listening audience, and thank you for joining us again on another edition of IID, that is Interfaith and a Cultural Dialogue, here on KCP 88.1. Uh, we have two guests going with us today, but I'd like to, first of all, uh, let me, let's bring our guest in, DJ Paul. Today, we're, our subject is going to be the, um, the Ottoman Empire and an era of tolerance. It's an aspect of history that Many times here in the West or in the United States, we don't hear a great deal about, and probably not in the world. Uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, was um, actually emerged in the Islamic faith probably at about the 12th century, and then had the longest caliphate or ruling body of Islam uh, some 600 years, and, and the caliphate lasted with 35 sultans. Our guest will be joining us shortly, I believe. Uh, do we have our guest on now? Can you, yes, can you bring both? Can we? Good, thank you. And our guest today is we have two individuals joining us. Both of them have a very extensive background. But before I go there, let me just stop for a moment and before I introduce them and, and just mention to some of you, and I'm sure it's been in your news or in electronic news or if you're watching you know, on the radio, if you turn on television, the Facebook, the events that are going on in Ukraine. And, and we, as a part of interfaith and a cultural dialogue, we prefer to believe that dialogue is the best way to resolve issues, not through military violence and conflict. So we join the world in condemning the actions of, uh, of Vladimir Putin and the uh, Russian government for their violent intrusions and the atrocities they are committing on the Ukrainian people uh, in there in that land, and that the world is joining together to echo those sentiments, and and in the Muslim holy book, the Quran, God says, and when one one person wars against somebody else, if you can't cease them to stop fighting, then all of them should come together against that one person to make sure that you can cease the violence. And so we pray the best, and we pray God's mercy on the people of Ukraine and the bravery and the courage they are showing. I believe we're already seeing those blessings, and we can watch a miracle unfold over millions of people who are willing to stand up in the face of oppression and aggression. And as an African-American, I echo the sentiments of uh, the icon and Nobel uh, laureate Dr. Martin Luther King. He says, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think that that is being shown. So thank you also for that. And that is a part of our IID family interfaith intercultural dialogue. We'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, Rabbi Sandy Axelrod of Temple near to me. Uh, we're all part of the board of Interfaith Council of Southern Nevada. He held a warm vigil last night for the citizens of uh, and a prayer vigil at Temple near to me for the citizens. And there were uh, hundreds plus people attended it. For the, for the citizens and the people of Ukraine. Our guest today for this subject matter, and I think it's even relevant to what's happening today, is uh, one, first we have our Professor John Curry from UNLV right here locally in Las Vegas. And I just want to give a piece of background on John because I think it's important in, in light of the subject that we're having. Uh, John Curry's associate professor received his BA in history with a minor in Sub-Saharan African Studies from Northwestern University in 1992 after spending a year in Cairo, Egypt, and other parts of the Near East on a Fulbright scholarship during the 1992-93 academic year. He returned to acquire a dual MA uh, from the Ohio State University in both the Department of History and Arabic Language in 1998. After, after several years of work and research in Turkey, manuscripts, libraries, and archives, he completed his dissertation on early modern Ottoman 
religious history and received a PhD in history from the Ohio State University. Just in the last here, I'm not giving you the full scope of the bio. His research focuses on the history of mystical religions and intellectual movements in the Ottoman Empire, which is part of our discussion today, and in, 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 in Byron's. His first book, The Transformation of Muslim Mystical Thought in the Ottoman Empire, The Rise of the Haldeti Order, and uh, was published in Edinburgh University Press in 210 and, and with strong reviews. And uh, Professor John Curry, John, welcome to Interfaith and the Cultural Dialogue. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, our next guest, uh, Dr. Wayne Petrovich, and uh, born as a lecturer at uh, Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Department of Peace and Studies. And uh, that gives us a great much to talk about today, uh, Boyan, in terms of peace in this world. Uh, Dr. Petrovich uh, lectures in the Peace and Studies Department. His areas of research and teaching expertise stretch over the disciplinary boundaries of international and relations and com comparative politics. <clears throat> and the general role of religion plays in the international relations. Dr. Petrovich uh, has recently published two books, Afghan, The Political History of the Buffer State and 210, and Islam and the Temple Power in 212. And he's currently working on a book titled Islam in the West, a comparative study of Muslim communities in Europe and the United States. In addition to Chapman, he also teaches at the University of California, Irvine, and has taught at the University of California, Los Angeles, Korea University, Seoul, and, uh, and uh, Ikhwan, Women's University in Seoul. Thank you, uh, Boyan, uh, Dr. Boyan Petrovich. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Just a question for both of you. Well, it's one question, but I'd like to get a response. Um, it's an observation, you could call it. The events that we're seeing unfolding uh, there in, in the Ukraine and what is how it unfolds into Europe and how it unfolds into the United States. Um, John, what, what time in history are we when we begin to see these things unfold to such a degree? Uh, well, the history of the Ukraine is uh, sort of something probably best uh, left to one of my colleagues who specializes in this, but uh, we can really track it back uh, into medieval times. Um, you know, in fact, prior to the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, uh, what we would probably today loosely call, you know, Russian history centered around Kiev. Um, and uh, various uh, kingdoms that were sort of operational um, in that region. Um, and uh, the devastation of, uh, of Kiev and the surrounding regions by the Mongol conquests in the uh, early 13th century uh, was eventually, in fact, what shifted the uh, gravity of power in modern uh, uh, Russia today to the, the areas that you know, we would now sort of uh, identify as being the centers of uh, Russia, not necessarily Moscow yet, but um, you know some of the uh, regions uh, surrounding it. Um, so you can uh, track uh, a lot of this back uh, to to then. And um, when these uh, polities um, around where Moscow is today begin to expand their influence in the late 15th century, in part by adopting gunpowder weaponry and firearms, um, they began to um, spread throughout the Eurasian landmass um, and eventually including into Ukraine to create uh, what is basically now the largest uh, land uh, state in the world in terms of geography. And so uh, that is really sort of the background to what we're seeing today. Interesting. So, you know, they say everything is connected, and you can begin to see the connecting this based on what uh, Professor Curry has shared with us. Boyan, um, many times I see many names that reflect similar to your last name in pronunciation right. and such. And I've, I've conducted weddings for many people from Ukraine. Uh, tell us, give us your observation about the current climate that we're in, what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, the time in history we're in, and events that actually also reflect that, that have happened in history. 
<laughs> well, what, what we're seeing nowadays is a violation of the sovereignty of a country that has uh, enjoyed an independent status since the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. Uh, this is the country that uh, has uh, been uh, an independent political entity prior to that, after the end of the Tsarist Russia, uh, and uh, uh, in the early stages of uh, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. It, uh, uh, however, uh, has um, uh, been uh, in the neighborhood of uh, the Russian state, uh, the Russian bear that stretches over 11 time zones, uh, and that um, uh, denies, obviously, sovereignty of Ukraine and the right of Ukrainian people to uh, have uh, their own state and uh, uh pursue foreign policy that is in line with the uh, desire of uh, the uh, majority of the Ukrainian people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, the Ukrainian people have seemed to have a tremendous amount of resilience and resistance and fortitude. I don't think I've seen that since the civil rights movement in this country uh, during the 1950s and 60s. I don't think I've seen that type of, and of course, the recent events that happened with the social unrest around that particular round, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and those events. But I haven't, I haven't, I hadn't seen that kind of resistance where people were standing up. But this one is even more volatile because they're out there putting their, their, their lives are really at stake, but they're standing up. And so our prayers are with them. With the, the history, the subject today is the Ottoman Empire, which if, if our listening audience, and thank you for listening in, it's a part of really the, the old, whole Islamic uh, nation itself. Uh, it was the, I believe both, I can be corrected on this, in terms of time frame, it was the longest six centuries in terms of Ottoman Empire rule. I know that there was first the Umayyad, then the Albasid dynasty, and the Seljuks and the Mamluks. But the um, Ottomans seem to have had the longest history, and the Ottoman Empire emerged out of what we now know as modern-day Turkey, but before the Ottoman population, what we know became the Ottomans and became what we call Turkish people, can either and or both of you comment on what was the nature and the culture as they, as they evolved into Islam? Where did, the, where did the Turkish population come from? What was their history? What was their culture before Islam? Um, mm-hmm. Boyan. Uh, well, the Turkish people uh, came from Central Asia, uh, and uh, they were um, early adopters of Islam as an important part of expansion of the uh, Abbasid Empire in the 8th century. Uh, They were at the margins of uh, the um, uh, early Islamic Empire uh, and were on the periphery uh, before actually becoming uh, a central part of of, uh, Islamic uh, political entities that came into being as a result of the slow disintegration of the Abbasid Empire, uh, is starting with the 9th century, but then intensifying in the 10th and 11th centuries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, uh, and then no, they moved... Um, if, 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 oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, uh, so jo- I want to go to John on this point here, because in your... Um, Part of your research uh, includes the Ottoman Empire and, and, and in your book, The Transformative of Muslim Mystical Thought. Uh, how much did mystical thought, is there a connection between mystical thought and particularly the mystical thought of Jaladin Rumi and the, in the transformation of the Ottoman Empire? Mm-hmm. Y- yeah, that, that's in fact, uh, you know, uh, a big part of the story. And, uh, you know, I, I would add um, uh, to the uh, narrative outline so far um, that we now know as historians um, that in addition to sort of the Abbasid and their successor states' roles at uh, integrating Turkic peoples uh, into uh, the Muslim world, um, there was a, a period of dramatic climate change between the 10th and 11th centuries, a period of global cooling in this region um, that drove huge waves of Central Asian Turkic peoples out of the uh, colder steppe lands of Central Asia uh, and into other parts of the world. 
Um, and this uh, sort of helped to found entities like the Great Seljuk Turkish State, which eventually spread into Anatolia at the expense of the Byzantine Empire, which was also damaged by this uh, climate change phenomenon. And in sweeping through the regions of the Near East, um, they picked up a lot of the uh, mystical traditions from places like Iraq and Iran, where they had been dominant up to that point, and carried them uh, westward into other regions of the Muslim world, including um, Asia Minor. Uh, and uh, you know, Rumi uh, was, in fact, uh, the grandson of one of these mystics that was uh, basically uh, uh, driven out of what today is northern Afghanistan by uh, the wave of the Mongol invasions that followed these uh, Turkic migrations and accelerated them further. Um, so, yes, this is a very big part of the story. John, and so Rumi was not ethnically, he was not Turkish, he was Afghan, Afghani. Uh, yeah, I, I actually had a uh, Af Afghani mentor um, uh, uh, when I was in uh, graduate school, um, uh, uh, Alam Payant, and he used to be able to recite uh, Rumi by memory in Dari Persian, um, which was the language of Rumi and in, in which he wrote uh, most of his works. Um, but when he uh, came to Asia Minor, he occupied a, uh, a, a sectarian and an ethnic milieu that was made up of uh, everybody from uh, Byzantine Greeks to uh, uh, Persians to Arabs to uh, Turkic speaking peoples to Armenians and so um, you know his uh, language and the, the kind of narratives told about him you know reflect the fact that this was a place where a lot of people ended up um, either as refugees or just simply because this was kind of a crossroads of the world at the time. Interesting. Boyan, um, Rumi's thought and its effect on the, the, the philosophy and uh, of, of the Ottoman Empire, uniquely enough, among, uh, the, among the Islamic caliphs, and, it, and the Ottoman Empire obviously being the last, um, the, um, you know, there was, there was this, one, it, the Ottomans didn't rule initially large Muslim populations, they ruled large non-Muslim populations. What was it within the philosophy of Rumi that affected them that, to embrace more diversity and have the capacity to rule where there was large Christians and Jew, Jewish populations at? Yes, you're, you're right about pointing out the uh, what we would nowadays describe uh, as a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional uh, empire of the Ottomans. Uh, as being one that had to develop methods of uh, dealing with uh, significant Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, and uh, other non-Muslim uh, minorities. And uh, Rumi thought definitely played a role in uh, informing uh, uh, administrative practices uh, and uh, what would, uh, uh, in the 19th century among Europeans, start being referred to as the Millic system or the system uh, that would uh, grant very significant uh, autonomy to religious groups. And I uh, stress that those were religious groups because uh, it was religious identity that really mattered uh, in the 15th, 16th, uh, and later centuries. Until the 19th century, ethnicity really uh, does not become uh, that much relevant un until later uh, in the process. But uh, the, uh, the uh, militism played an important role uh, of uh, uh, integrating various religious communities uh, into the Ottoman uh, administrative uh, practices. Ottomans were very pragmatic, uh, pragmatic and, and at the same time uh, took advantage of the fact that uh, in many instances the military themselves would uh, self-organize uh, and it didn't necessarily have to be coordinated from the top of the uh, empire. Mm -hmm. You know, as we talk about the integration and or the multiplicity or the diversity of the ruling of the Ottoman Empire, both of you, if you could comment on what was the status, and we hear now in Ukraine about the, the Jewry population, the Jew population. And, uh, of course, we know that in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered America. That was an epoch in history, but it was also the time that 
the Muslims had suffered their first defeat since the emergence of Islam on the Arabian Peninsula. It was 700 years until 1492, and the Muslims were defeated in Alhambra and Granada. And so the Jewish population and the Muslim population were forced to convert, die, or become a refugee. And the, the, the Jewish population seemingly have came largely into the Ottoman Empire or was under Islamic uh, uh, traditions and values. Can, can both of you comment on the status of Jews within, as you say, see it, within the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire? Uh, I, I guess I can take the first. lead. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I can. I guess I can start. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I would probably not call this the first defeat um, uh, for Muslims. I mean, really, the Reconquista had had the upper hand um, since uh, at least the 13th century. Um, but that mm -hmm. all being said, yes, most Jews did um, uh, uh, end up uh, migrating out of Spain slowly but surely in a gradual process or sort of uh, went underground um, for much of the succeeding century. Um, the majority of them probably went to North Africa, but significant numbers of them do start to appear in places that we would today call Greece, um, such as Thessaloniki or Salonika, um, as it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. And significant mm -hmm. communities also settled in places like um, Istanbul as well. And there's an, uh, a, a saying at one point that, you know, when Bayezid II, the ruling sultan at the time, you know, got wind of these Jewish uh, communities sort of uh, debarking and settling in his realms, he sort of commented that, uh, you know, these, these Spanish kings are fools. They're sending me all of their wealth, you know, which sort of... <laughs> Uh, indicated that he grasped uh, that, uh, you know, these communities, you know, if treated well and resettled successfully in his kingdom, you know, might bring, you know, benefits rather than threats to his, his rule. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, uh, this, this was true. And uh, you know, Jewish communities often preferred the Ottoman uh, rule over uh, that of uh, many uh, uh, Christian states in Europe uh, because they, the, the Muslim states lack the sort of intersectarian animosity that's characterized Christianity and Judaism throughout its history. Uh -huh. Now, you know, it really brings a point to the fact that uh, actually the Sephardic Jews, based on to our, to our listening audience, um, and I think Professor Curry John has read this book, God's Shadow, is written by Alan McHale, and it's the, uh, the Sultan Selim, the Ottoman Empire, and the making of the modern world. And it's a very interesting historical document and he reflects in here that the Sephardic Jews refer to those Jews who trace their origins back to the communities exiled from Spain in 1492. So even before, uh, before uh, being in the Ottoman Empire, these Jews had lived under Islamic rule for already, already for almost 700 years. I'll comment, if you will, Boyan, on what the Christians also, there were many Christians who preferred Islamic rule over the church in the Christian rule and the Pope. Well, uh, exactly. Uh, as uh, as my co-panelist has already indicated, uh, not only uh, Jews, but uh, uh, also Christians in many instances preferred living in uh, what uh, uh, may have appeared for the standards of, uh, of medieval times as uh, tolerant cosmopolitan societies. In addition to uh, Thessaloniki and or Salonika and Istanbul, uh, there was also uh, a fairly large community of Sephardic Jews uh, in Sarajevo, in the Balkans. So. And uh, uh, they uh, had a, a long history of living peacefully together with Muslims uh, and Christians in the city. Uh, that would be devastated uh, in uh, the wars in the Balkans in the 1990s. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, yes, some of those synagogues uh, have been preserved in Sarajevo, but uh, there are uh, the community of Jews uh, has uh, been reduced in size as a result of the. Uh, more of the 1990s. Uh, but yes, uh, in many instances, uh, uh, it would be uh, um, 
better for for some of the Christians. Um, that was not uh, necessarily always true. That was not true throughout the history of the Ottoman Empire, but at uh, times, so, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, particularly in the 15th and 16th century, and then later uh, in the 19th century as well. Yes, you know, and actually say actually throughout the Ottoman Empire, because we also see at the end, we won't go there now, and I'm not sure we have enough time, is the, the, the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Um, John, it seems as though, uh, in particular, Selim, the, the Sultan Selim, and, and John, what would be a good definition for our listening audience is what the Sultan means? What would that mean in terms of, as a title? Mm-hmm. Well, it basically derives from you know an, an Arabic root of uh, 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 sultana, which you know basically means to, to have authority or exercise authority. Um, it sort of mm-hmm. developed out of the medieval vocabulary as basically referring to somebody who has um, uh, political authority, but who's not the khalifa or the the caliph, um, who eventually you know, you know came to who was who tended to be imbued also with religious authority. Uh, as well, um, so it sort of uh, referred primarily to somebody who had political authority. And uh, you know, Mikhail's book is uh, you know an interesting addition to the literature in large part because he sort of frames um, this very brief re- reign of uh, uh, Salim the First as, as Sultan from 1512 to 1520 as being a uh, sort of a, a, you know. A pivotal moment um, in world history. Um, you know, I should state here that this has gotten the attention of a lot of people in the popular press. Um, specialists in the Ottoman Empire, such as myself, are a bit more skeptical of this. Um, it, it's what we call a great man theory of history. Um, and uh, that tends to uh, uh, not uh, have a, a very good standing in the historical field anymore. Um, uh, we tend to look instead at, at sort of much more broad Broad developments in Ottoman society uh, that point in this direction. Um, and Salim's major, major accomplishment really uh, was the sort of uh, uh, surprising success of his uh, military campaigns to expand the empire. Uh, But he really Mm -hmm. died before he could consolidate all of that. And most of the consolidation process was in fact carried out um, by his successors and more accurately an army of Ottoman intellectuals and statesmen under them um, and also royal harem women, um, quite frankly, um, who uh, uh, helped to sort of build and consolidate the empire into what it was today. Um, so I have to admit that, uh, you know, I sort of have a problem with Mikhail's uh, framing, um, although uh, much of what he summarizes in his book is uh, a fairly accurate portrayal uh, of uh, the basics of Salim's uh, rule. But I think he makes some broad sweeping claims as part of that that have been rightly criticized in the reviews of it. Mm-hmm. Well, is this something that you would recommend for the general public that would broaden their knowledge? I was also deeply impressed by his uh, observations in terms of slavery itself and the Papal's um, document decree declaring that the Portuguese king and queen had a right to enslave African people. And this was actually done back, you know, I'm talking about the 13th or 14th century. The slavery didn't and didn't be conceptualized until the 15th and 16th century, but it was interesting that he was able to make the connection, and also the fact that the the Crusades really from that part of the world to the United States to America, where it became the United States, really this was a, a continuation of the Crusades. How is how mm-hmm. is that embraced? Uh, yeah, I I think to some extent, um, you know, that there is some some truth to that. Um, we do know that the uh, Iberian maritime expansions uh, were driven primarily by two things. Um, I think Mikhail uh, uh, basically uh, argues for one having a greater uh, uh, weight over the other, um, and uh, that is the sort of uh, religious imperative. And we do have um, sources from Portuguese and Spanish um, uh, uh, explorers that do suggest that you know religious uh, issues were a big part of their motivation. Uh, but the other big part of their motivation is money. Uh, 
Um, and we do have to ask that if, you know, after all the wealth they eventually generated from the conquests of the Americas, um, if this conflict with the Islamic world was their primary concern, then why did all that money get dumped into their conflicts in Europe instead? Um, and we can sort of see that the, uh, you know, the Spanish Habsburgs, um, you know, while they also conflict with the Ottomans, they reserved the lion's share of their ire for fighting in Europe, and especially against uh, the Reformation and various uh, uh, other uh, states that they tried to control that were embracing, you know, various kinds of Christian sectarianism. Uh, so to, to some extent, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here, and uh, as a historian, one of the things we're always taught to be wary of is trying to oversimplify things a little bit too much. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just sense in this case, um, you know, th- there might be a bit of oversimplification or just sort of highlighting one thing at the expense of a, a bigger picture that we have to take into account. Um, I, I would recommend if you really want a sort of good starting overview for the Ottoman Empire for a popular audience, audience. My colleague Caroline Finkel, who's lived in Istanbul most of her life and uh, has written a very wonderful book called Osman's Dream uh, that covers it from beginning to end, is really an excellent introduction that I highly recommend. Ms. Caroline Finkel, Osman's Dream. Okay, yes. thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. That's very informative. We need that. I'd certainly like to gain more insight into the Ottoman Empire itself. Um, you know, Bohan, the the back to the mystical thinking of, of roaming, the philosophy of embracing multicultural and very pluralistic environments, we, we find that in the thinking of people like today's contemporary uh Islamic scholar um Muhammad Julan and and his insights and the the whole how how does this does the the ability to develop and work with multiplicity and pluralism in society, does it go back to the prophet, peace be upon him, himself and his companions, or, or was it a strictly an Ottoman Empire introduction? Well, uh, the Ottoman practices uh, were uh, more developed uh, than uh, the practices uh, that go back to the uh, early Islamic community of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, in the city of uh, Medina uh, in particular, uh, and that is the practice that is oftentimes uh, associated with uh, what would uh, Ottomans develop. But as I was saying earlier, Ottomans were uh, driven by a variety of purposes, one of which was uh, the practices of Prophet Muhammad in the early times of uh, Islamic community. But then there were also uh, 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 pragmatic reasons, uh, and that is the composition, very uh, diverse composition of the Ottoman Empire that would force the Ottomans to adopt the rules because uh, the process of extension of the empire was uh, uh, fairly fast. Uh, and would incorporate large number of non-Muslims, uh, which uh, pushed them in the direction of um, of uh, uh, adopting uh, those uh, existing practices and allowing a fair amount of diversity from an administrative point of view. So, what what could have been seen as a liability, seemingly the Ottoman Empire turned it into an asset. Well. Uh, the fact that uh, the Ottoman Empire, as it started introducing reforms in the 19th century, had a, a, a had substantial difficulty of uh, uh, reconciling the idea of um, political citizenship uh, extended to all uh, and uh, the preservation of the practices uh, that have uh, uh, defined much of the history of the Ottoman Empire uh, that were uh, favored by significant portions of the Ottoman society. So there was a conflict mm-hmm. between the desire to uh, introduce what we would call uh, the idea of uh, universal citizenship and uh, individual rights uh, and preserve uh, the kind of uh, status which uh, uh, was to a certain extent uh, hierarchical because uh, it, uh, uh, according to the standards of a modern state, discriminates against uh, uh, religious minorities, 
uh, to, uh, to, to reconcile the practices of the Ottoman Empire with the um, notion of uh, universal citizenship rights. Uh, speaking of universal citizenship, what was the status of women in the Ottoman Empire? Um, Boya, the status of women. Uh, well, uh, we uh, th there is an emergent scholarship uh, on uh, the public role of women uh, that was less known uh, by uh, earlier generations of scholars. And uh, we uh, know that uh, Ottoman women were um, able to own businesses, to be involved uh, in uh, uh, various uh, uh, ways uh, in uh, business communities. Uh, they were uh, also uh, empowered with the right to inherit property. Uh, they were uh, definitely under moral authority of men. Uh, but women in the countryside, for example, were actively involved in households, uh, both uh, inside of the homes uh, and outside on the fields where uh, they were heavily involved in agricultural production, uh, which was one uh, of the key uh, economic activities in the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, John, in and, and, uh, Khalil's book, he, he speaks of... Um Salim's relationship with his mother, who actually was a slave and a concubine to his father, correct? That is correct, yes. Uh, most Ottoman sultans after the first uh, uh, one or two um, all uh, were of that status. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, give us some insight into that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I would actually add to the uh, uh, excellent discussion of my uh, co-panelist here that uh, uh, going back to uh, the Quran itself, um, the, uh, uh, the, the joke among Islamic scholars and jurisprudence is that the law of inheritance is half of all knowledge because the Quran very carefully sets out uh, divisions for both the male and female relations in society. And so if you look at... Ottoman court records, and indeed is Muslim court records throughout history, you find plenty of women going to the court and contesting their rights, and invariably uh, they win. Um, because the Quran is very clear that women have a stake in this, and uh, so therefore they do own business, they endow pious foundations, and we find them just all over the place in the historical record. Now, the Ottoman harem um, is in fact a, a very important point as well that you've also raised. Um, and uh, what made the uh, harem important is that the, the, the Ottomans realized very early on uh, that if they married other members members of royal families or people with their own power bases within uh, Turkic societies, um, that sometimes the other branch of the family could then interfere in the politics of the state. Uh, so eventually the Ottoman rulers uh, adopted a policy of concubinage where they would only uh, reproduce and have uh, descendants um, through these uh, concubine slave women um, who were uh, of an exalted status uh, once they gave birth to a male descendant um, for the uh, sultan. Uh, but nevertheless, they were born slaves and could claim no right to any kind of political legitimacy in the uh, Ottoman system. Um, now, of course, the exception to that is a of course, is through their sons, who can very much claim uh, you know, the uh, Ottoman system, uh, political legitimacy. And uh, the problem with this is the Ottomans didn't have what the Europeans did in the form of primogeniture. The eldest son always accedes to the throne before the younger. In the Ottoman and other Turkic systems, uh, any male descendant of the sultan or even a relative um, could contest for the throne. And often the death of an Ottoman sultan up through the 17th and 18th centuries was often accompanied by by a bloody civil struggle um, between brothers uh, of the uh, 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 between brothers who were descended from the ruling sultan over who would win that, and their mothers always tried to maneuver their sons into some kind of a position where they could claim the throne as a result. And this process is called bloody canistry, um, and it goes back into uh, early Turkic times. The great Seljuk state. Um, in the medieval area in the 11th in the 11th century in fact fell apart because one of these uh, episodes occurred and the civil war went on for decades and was never fully resolved um, 
so this was always a challenge for the Ottomans. You know, you know, how are you going to manage the succession? And the people in line for the succession knew this was a life or death struggle. And it had an advantage in that the most competent candidate or the most well-backed candidate usually came to the throne and was prepared to rule as a result. But the downside was is if this wasn't resolved very quickly, um, it could really destabilize the empire. And the women played an extremely important role in all of this. And that role only increased in the 17th century as the sultans began to sort of recede in authority and presence into the palace. And uh, the royal women developed entire networks of patronage to help govern the empire sort of side by side with the sultan and had substantial political power in their own right. Interesting. That's something you you wouldn't hear about in Islam. I I had not heard of. I would say you wouldn't hear about. But there's so much to be learned from that. I, you know, Boyan, there was a point that we talked about earlier. I wanted to get a bit of insight. There's a book I think written by uh, Elaine Bao, and it talks. Of, it gives you some insight into the pre-Islamic uh, sh- uh, culture of those who became Turkish and, of course, Muslims in the Ottoman Empire. What type of culture were they herdsmen? Uh, I get the impression they may have been shaman, and that that they were that their culture, the nature of their culture, was being generous and kind and understanding. Many of the principles we hold as Muslims that this population, this society, already had that in the culture. Is, is there any? Give us some insights into that. Yes, uh, the uh, pre-Islamic culture was nomadic. Uh, and we're talking about herders for the most part, uh, who were into shamanism, uh, into what one could describe as uh, pagan practices uh, uh, that, for example, preceded uh, Islam also uh, elsewhere, particularly on the Arabian Peninsula. And um, uh, what I would add to this is also the fact that uh, the practices uh, of uh, Turkic people is what would eventually develop into a Turkish version of Islam uh, that uh, contributed to uh, the variety of uh, already present Persian and Arabic uh, ver- versions of Islam uh, in uh, the Ottoman Empire. Hmm. Okay. And, John, the, the decline of the Ottoman Empire, is there a time frame where we can say, okay, this is where we see the decline? And what contributed to the decline of the Ottoman Empire? Oh, boy, you are asking such a fraught question here. I mean, in some ways, this is the question um, for Ottoman uh, historians. And I would have to say my answer is probably going to be mine alone, and there's going to be 200 different other ones where people are going to argue everything from uh, the Ottomans can't really say, be said to be declining until the later 19th century. Others would say, oh, it declined after Sultan Suleiman. Um, you know, my take on it is based on some recent um, discoveries um, that grow not out of Ottoman history as much as on climatology. Um, we know that the Ottomans, along with the rest of the world, were afflicted by a period known as the Little Ice Age, uh, starting in the late 16th century and continuing through the 17th. And it created a global phenomenon called the general 17th century crisis. We see the Ming Dynasty in China. China collapse uh, due to lack of food because global cooling destroyed most, mo- most of the harvests across China in the 1630s and 1640s. Um, we see similar problems uh, occurring throughout the Ottoman Empire starting in the uh, 1590s and continuing. Um, and the global cooling trend meant that much of the regions of the uh, Ottoman Empire, which are above uh, 2,000 feet in altitude, became agriculturally unsustainable sustainable as a result of the crisis. And this created what was called in Turkish the Büyük Kaçgünlük, or the Great Flight, um, where all of the agricultural populations either reverted to pastoral nomadism to survive, or they fled down into the lower coastal regions and sort of swelled the cities and created all kinds of catastrophes. Um, And we see throughout the 17th century, the Ottomans struggled to manage these catastrophes. Um, They were 
chronically short of money and funds. At times, they were literally cannibalizing their own elites to survive. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, basically this, uh, you know, dramatically weakened Ottoman efficiency and fighting ability throughout the 17th century. And we now know that the Ottomans' population numbers at the end of the 16th century were not reached again until the 19th century. And that huge mm. swaths of the empire reverted from agricultural, agricultural life to pastoral, uh, nomadic populations. And, uh, you know, some world historians, probably including myself, would now argue um, that the real reason for the decline of the Ottomans, if we can call it that, uh, was that they were devastated by climate change. And you can see the same thing for the Ming Dynasty in China, Stuart England, you also see the collapse of the monarchy there. The Thirty Years' War in Europe is a good example of this. Uh, but the difference between what happens in places like Western Europe and the Ottoman Empire is that Western Europe sort of pulls themselves out of this crisis through their growing interconnected global networks and the Colombian exchange bringing in all these new food crops that sort of allows them to sort of rebuild more quickly than the Ottomans are able to. And so I would argue the general 17th century crisis set back the Ottomans enough uh, that they just simply struggled to catch back up in the development of the world that followed. Um, but, you know, as I said, my argument is as controversial as any and uh, you know there are other people who would take issue with that and, and go in a completely different direction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well thank you very much john that was I, that's a, a great deal more than i was aware of and uh, there are always they say these connecting aspects to it now we're seeing that connection in a very very broad global sense oh, bogan um you know with speaking of the global sense we now have we're in the we would like to think in the latter phases of a pandemic, and many times the, these events occur around pandemics. And that's one of them continually. I think that's what John was referring to in some regards. We have global warming. We have the coronavirus. Uh, we have now mass migration going on at one level. Who knows when it stops? How much does today reflect back on what we've already seen historically? They say, you know, there's no uh, new history, they're just new people. Are we repeating a cycle all over again? Well, I don't know if we're uh, uh, repeating it uh, exactly, uh, but I think that there is definitely a pattern that one can trace to earlier times. Uh, and scholars of international relations would... Uh, for example, point to uh, what uh, they call um, uh, shifts uh, in international politics uh, resulting from redistribution of uh, military, political, and economic power. And uh, that is what seems to be uh, happening in front of our eyes, uh, in addition to the processes that you've described, pandemic and uh, climate change. Uh, uh, there is also a uh, redistribution of political power in uh, uh, East uh, Asia with the uh, rise of China uh, and the increasing volatility in uh, uh, other regions, uh, in addition to Russia, which uh, we already mentioned. Uh, there is also worry about uh, Iran's uh, uh, aspiration to playing a role of a regional hegemon in the Persian Gulf area. Uh, and uh, there's obviously uh, 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 a long-lasting threat of North Korea and its uh, aspirations of uh, bringing about changes on the Korean Peninsula. So um, those are kinds of issues that uh, uh, so-called realist scholars of international politics would predict uh, in, uh, uh, in the kind of circumstances where we see uh, a slow decline of uh, the military primacy of the United States uh, and the emergence of what in the jargon of international relations would be described as a power vacuum. Hmm. So it hasn't been filled yet. It's just a vacuum. Yeah, that may be that's interesting. Uh, John, I um, only recently, of, of the Islamic caliphates and the Ottoman Empire being the last of those, those great caliphates, it, did the Ottoman Empire have the longest, longest turn in terms of a caliphate over the other two or three that were major? 
I know well, they were always I would, for leakers, but I, I would argue no. And um, in large part, there's a sort of a dirty little secret about all of this, and that is that uh, when the uh, Ottomans sort of rose to power, um, you know, which was chronicled to a, a great extent in Mikhail's book in their conquest of the Mamluk Empire of Egypt. Um, after the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad uh, fell in uh, 1258, and the last Caliph was sort of unceremoniously executed by uh, Chinggis Khan's grandson, um, the Caliphate sort of temporarily moved to Cairo as sort of a, you know, the, the last surviving relatives of the Caliph set up in Cairo and in the, um, in the Mamluk Sultanate. But they really held no power influence and were really kept there only as figureheads. And so when the Ottomans march in in 1517 and take it over, you know, in theory, they also sort of take over these last descendants of the caliphs. But for all intents and purposes, the Ottomans never really appealed to that for any legitimacy at all until the 19th century when it became clear that the empire was not successfully competing with European imperial power uh, around the world. So why would that be? Well, the reason is they know that, you know, uh, places like Great Britain and France are starting to imperially take over places like the Indian subcontinent with large numbers of Muslims and Muslim communities under their rule. And by sort of more strongly emphasizing this sort of uh, link to the caliphate in this time and place, um, they can make a claim for religious authority over the Muslim communities in these imperial powers and thereby bring to bear political leverage um, on the imperial powers to treat the Ottomans better and uh, not take such advantage of the Ottomans' weakened military and diplomatic position, um, especially after the uh, 1860s. Um, so to a great extent, the Ottomans only really emphasized the caliphate as a significant part of their heritage um, in the 19th century. And prior to that, they were quite content to simply, uh, you know, posit the Ottoman house itself as the proper fount of their political legitimacy and its very longevity uh, inspired uh, that kind of uh, legitimacy uh, without any really need to appeal to the caliphate. So there's actually a kind of an interesting story behind that. Um, the very longevity of their reign um, probably gave them quite a bit of legitimacy in their own right without even appealing to that. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Are scientific, educational, academic contributions, did they, has the Ottomans made a, did they make a contribution to what we call the Islamic emergency of, of scientific knowledge? It's funny you should mention oh, yeah. that. I literally have a, a book being delivered to my door right now that's the product of about 10 years of translation work um, that I did with um, other notable uh, people who work on Ottoman studies. And it's a copy of the first printed text in the Ottoman Empire, at least in Ottoman Turkish, um, called the Cosmographia, um, which is basically a world geography put together in the 17th century by a scholar named Katip Chelebi and then combined with a later Arab geographer to create a giant Ottoman geography of the world. And that book is sort of full of all of the knowledge the Ottomans were acquiring, both from the scientific revolution in Europe through various sources and also through the historical geography of the Ottoman Empire. And it sort of represented a fusion of these branches of knowledge both coming out of Europe in that time and also the sort of extensive corpus of um, uh, geographical work going back into Arab medieval times. Um, so yes, the Ottomans did have a flourishing scientific and intellectual culture. Uh, what it lacked in comparison to Europe was the sort of sustained institutional framework that would allow that to grow and develop. It was often sort of tackled primarily by individuals or groups in society um, who could not always sort of sustain that over a longer term. So it would kind of ebb and flow in a way that after the 16th and 17th century didn't happen so much in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very interesting, and I, I hope to look forward to 
uh, following up on that book and seeing if I, we can access one and get that information to seem to fill in a lot of blanks. Uh, John, we talked about, and you've given me some insight into why is it now that myself, and I'm, I'm understanding maybe many other Americans or many people in the West, are learning more about Ottoman Empire history that after World War I, the, the tradition changed from an Islamic-based government and rule to a more secular base. Share, share with us the dynamics and why we're just now getting this information. Well, I, I teach a, a class in world history pretty much every semester because I'm one of the few people at the institution who can do it. And uh, I always start every single semester with a talk about, you know, why is world history becoming so important? Uh, because prior to 1970, there really wasn't something called world history as we understand that today. Um, you know, they, 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 they would have it, but it was very different from what it is now. The idea that you would sort of try and understand the broad framework of the global system in a single class would have been considered something only a specialist would attempt. But now we're literally teaching this to ninth and 10th graders um, in high schools, who 300,000 of whom every year take an AP exam on this topic. And so as part and parcel of that, you know, people have to start learning things about, you know, how do you teach the Ottoman Empire? How do you teach the Safavid dynasty of Iran or the Mughals of the Indian subcontinent to, uh, to boot? Um, and so, in large part because of this growing imperative, in 2002, when I first graded the AP World History exams, there were 20,000 students taking that exam. Now there's over 300,000, and it's probably going to approach a half a million by the end of the decade. So, um, you know, with this growth comes a need for more knowledge, and that's kind of why uh, things like the Ottoman Empire are starting to swim more and more into the public view in a way that they would not have. Uh, before. Uh, this is going to be intriguing as we go forward. Uh, President John F. Kennedy, I think, God rest his soul, he, he, I think he didn't coin the phrase, but he said, is, one thing we learn from history is we do not learn. I think from this discussion today and looking at the light of the climate that we're in in this world, I believe that he was accurate or the person who coined that phrase was accurate because the truth is the truth. We see keep going back over time and time again. Maybe we'll get it right, so God willing, sometime, maybe in this era or not. Gentlemen, uh, Dr. Petrovich, to yourself, thank you for becoming a, being a part of Panelists and Interfaith and a Cultural Dialogue. Professor John Curry, thank you. Uh, both of you made a big contribution. I hope our listening audience will get a chance to hear this, and it will be placed on YouTube for an audio presentation that others can have a chance to digest it. Thank you to our listening audience for listening in and allowing us to be a part of your day. We pray that you will be well and that life will be good and that in time we'll have some peace in the world and, and not just in our lives but in the lives of people in the broader community. We'd always like to thank our sponsor, Civil Sage Foundation, for this continued collaboration of the Interfaith Council of Southern Nevada. Uh, we were part of that celebration last night at Temple Near to Mead and the prayers for the Ukrainian people which we can't really stop doing. We're all connected. This whole world is connected. Technology is now telling us what spirit had been telling us for years. So we hope and pray that we can find our way back to a straight path and find peace among ourselves. Again, thank our panelists for sharing that, that time and their insights. I hope we're going to bring, bring you back for other discussions around other issues around faith and culture. And uh, we pray the best for all of those of you listening in. And have a good life, and we'll talk to you again next month at the beginning of, we'll be right at the beginning of the month of Ramadan. We're now in the month of Shaban. We start fasting about the 3rd of April, and the, the subject we're going, is going to be fasting and our spiritual development. So we'll look forward to sharing that with our listening audience. We hope you listen in. Until then, be blessed and be well, and God take care of all of us, and keep everybody in your prayers. Thank you to, again, to our panelists, KCP, your technicians, and uh, the Interfaith Council and all those who support. Thank you. Be well, and thank you for coming in and sharing with us today. Have a good day and a good weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for having me.